model, it's 10 bits. Is it higher or lower than you expected? So we thought it would be 15, right? Because it's 50,000 words, log of the base 2 of 50,000 to the power 15. Why is it really 10? This is, it's 32 times lower, remember it's locked to the base 2. It's 32 times lower than it should be. <laughs> right? Why is that? Because English is so skewed, because the dice, if you think about the English as a 50,000 sided dice, it's a heavily loaded dice. You know, it's not equal information on all probabilities. Some of them are highly frequent, some of them are highly infrequent. So that's why each English word has only 10 bits of information. So 10 bits is about a byte. It's less than a byte. I mean, it's not less than a byte, so it's around a byte. So now when you go to context, it drops, right? So it gets to around 8.5 bits. So once you have one word of context or two words of context, each English word conveys less information than a byte. So in theory, you could replace each English word by a character. <laughs> right? That's not going to Okay. So Turing uh, did the same, a series of experiments with English characters, and they found that each character of English has a, somewhere between one and two bits of information. Okay. So with a good language model, right, the, having a good language model is important, each English word is about the same amount of information as the Bible. Okay. Questions about this? All right. So now, um, let's move on to code. So there's code. Okay. So, speaking of plots being exciting, uh, Abraham Hintle, uh, I don't know if you know Abraham, he's, uh, he's now a faculty member at, uh, at Al Alberta. He was postdoc with me at the time. So, he's, he's the guy who gets all the credit for this work. When he showed me this plot, I thought he was lying. I didn't believe him. Right? So, this, this is, I mean, this is really surprising. Right? So, what this is telling you is at the unigram level, each token of code has 7.5 bits of information at the unigram level, right? Now, code roughly has two to three times the vocabulary of English, right? <coughs> so, in fact, this is two and a half times more predictable than English, despite having a larger vocabulary, right? And once you get to the trigram model, look at this difference. So, it's around, let's say this is around 8.7 bits, this is around 3 bits. Code is between 4 and 5 bits less information than English, which means code is 16 to 30 times more predictable than English, right? So this means whatever algorithms the NLP people have come up with over the years, there have been 30 years of advances in NLP, whatever they have come, those algorithms should work so much better for code. So we can just take those things they have done and use them for code and make and do all kinds of interesting things, right? So that's what got me really excited about this area, is this difference, right? The difference between English and code is dramatic. Code is much more predictable. And you know, like with English, when we get into the higher order bits here, we don't we don't see as much benefit because we have various sorts of problems. Right? The other thing you see, the difference between C and code, uh, between English and code is context matters much more for code. Right? The, if you know a little bit of information about what comes before, you can do much better with code. Questions? Okay, so um, uh, along the same lines, uh, here's another interesting plot. So this is comparing the law corpus, the NASA corpus, Shakespeare, Brown, and <coughs> Okay, so essentially the y-axis here is cross entropy. That is, take a good model and measure the cross entropy. And so what we see here is Java is the most predictable. Java has the, the sort of lowest entropy. Law is the next higher entropy, NASA higher than that, and then Shakespeare and Brown are up there. Okay. So what this is telling us essentially is that, you know, so that that um, that because code is hard to write, people write code in a very effective way, so we get low information. Law and NASA are also technically difficult kinds of content. So people don't want to make it hard to read. So the information content of the law per token is fairly low because people write the same legal stuff over and over again. And similarly for NASA, it's technically dense. So the same language gets used over and over again. So um, you know, uh, Shakespeare and Brown are just general English and you, you get much higher information. Right there. 
the six buttons. Okay. So, um, so you know, just basically you can compare the zip plots I showed you earlier for the different purposes with the, with the entropy, and you can see the, the connection between the two. You can see these two are showing kind of similar sorts of effects, right? So you can see here that you know that um, Java's at the top and English and uh, Brown and Shakespeare are down here, and this is the NASA corpus and the legal corpus. And again, you see the same thing here with the NASA and the legal corpus but between English. Okay, so um, so is it that Java and C and Python are syntactically simpler than English? Okay, and so again, you know, we can do the same kind of cross entropy study. So remember what I said before: we can take everything out of English. There's prepositions, uh, you know, pronouns, and so on. You can take those out, close category words out of English. They can take the keywords and operators out of Java, and they can do a comparison. But here, instead of comparison with the zip plot, we do a comparison with the language model. Okay, so, you know, there's the standard Brown with all the words of Brown corpus. The standard Java, the same plot you saw before, with all the words in Java. So now, we do the Java with just the names, okay, leaving out all the identifiers, right? Um, you can see that it's between English and Brown, brown corpus in the full Java. And here's brown with just a name. So you take all the closed category words on brown and then you see it. One thing very interesting you see here with brown is the English corpus is when you take out the prepositions, it really don't, doesn't change much from the unigram model. Right? So you notice the brown, the top line, unigram is around you know, 12 and a half bits. And knowing additional context doesn't help you. So the prepositions are the closed category words in English. The prepositions, the pronouns, um, you know, those sorts of things carry a lot of information in English. And if you take those out, the context doesn't help you much. Whereas in Java, even if you take the keywords out, you still have a lot of information and the names are in You know, it's not that surprising. When you say system.out, okay, what comes next, right? <laughs> so, uh, and if you say Java, Lang, okay, you know. Java, you know, right? So, so in, in Java, the context uh, actually matters more than in English. Is this clear? Okay. All right, okay, so now the rest of, the rest of this is engineering. <laughs> okay, so we saw a lot of science about this. And I, I thought it's interesting to delve into the science of this because, you know, this is sort of the new area and, you know, it's, it's, it's good to get a grasp on the science and the methods that are being used here. So what? Okay. So the simplest thing you can do is to test tokens, right? So every IDE has a token suggestion. Right? You can say what goes here, and it will tell you what goes there. That's the simplest thing you can do. Um, so most of these environments have something like that. Um, so you know, the question you can ask is, what token um, can appear here, right? So uh, if you take uh, Eclipse, for example, default Eclipse, if you have a class instance and you put dot and you put a space, It'll say, this class is of this type, and I know these methods apply, I'm going to show you those methods. Right? So that's how we get it. And Eclipse can do that because it has access to type information. It can parse the, part, parse the code that's there, and it knows what type the variable is because it's seen the declaration. So it can tell you what methods are. Right? Um, so this uses a lot of information. So that it not right? Now, what a language model is saying is it doesn't know anything about the type information because all it has is tokens, right? These are in-gram language models that just simply knows the previous tokens. It doesn't really know anything about the type or the scope or any of that information. It just knows when I saw Java Lang, most of the time I saw this. When I saw Java Util, most of the time I saw this. When I saw System Out, most of the time I saw this. That's all it knows. Right? So it just says what token is most frequent. It's both a disadvantage and an advantage because in some cases, you know, like for open curly, there's no information about you know types there, right? It's just uh, what frequency it has occurred. Um, but if you don't know the types, it is, it doesn't know uh, it doesn't have certain kind of information, right? So um, so we're just using the previous two tokens, right? So in a sense, you know, 
we're taking a wild leap and saying, can we come up somehow compare these two things, uh, or combine them in some way to provide an efficient uh, way of doing this? Um, so, do engrams help these kinds of code suggestion contexts? So, what we do, I'm sorry about the formatting there. We take the Eclipse suggestion engine, which provides suggestions for mixed tokens. We use a statistical language model, which can provide suggestions for mixed tokens. We combine them. At every point, we can combine the two and try to make, make a guess as to what provides the best list of suggestions. Um, and then we can take any corpus of code and see how this combined suggestion engine and we can see how well we can uh, do this to see if the language model is providing any additional benefits. We can do this. So um, it's not clear that it comes to go to help because Eclipse has so much information already that it already can do a pretty good job of suggestions. So it's not clear that this is actually going to provide any additional benefit. So the question is how many additional correct suggestions are provided by combining Eclipse as opposed to uh, combining Eclipse with engrams as opposed to just having so what is the actual benefit of using these kinds of statistical models? Um, so you know, we can do this with two suggestions, six suggestions or ten suggestions. You know, so with different levels of uh, you know, suggestion budget, you can see how well this performs. Um, so and you know, basically what we find is that language models always improve the performance of, of Eclipse. Um, so we measure the benefit, uh, you know, uh, by the, the basically ignore all one and two characterizations. So suggesting open parentheses or semicolons or you know close parentheses, no, you know, we don't care about that. Right? It doesn't really say you anything. So we ignore those. Um, and so those are all ignored. We only consider benefit with either two suggestions, six suggestions, or ten suggestions. So this is a budget, right? You can always put a more suggestions to get benefit, but this is with respect to a certain budget of suggestions. Um, <coughs> And you consider both percent and absolute benefit in terms of the direct suggestion. Um, and we merge the suggestions from Eclipse with the suggestions from engrams um, by a simple heuristic. When the engram suggests a shorter recommendation, we prefer that. Right? And the reason is because programmers are likely to use shorter names more often, it's easier to type. So for shorter suggestions, we have better estimates. We have more frequent data for shorter suggestions. So the guesses from the engrams are more likely to be correct when you're suggesting shorter formats. Okay, so um, so let's see. Just kind of considering two suggestions. So this is the this is the kind of data we get. So it's a little confusing to read, and I apologize for that. So basically, this is the length of the suggestion and number of characters. We ignore anything less than two, um, and the Left y-axis is the percent gain over the cliff. So it's never less than zero. We always are somewhat above zero, right? Somewhat, somehow better than what Eclipse can do. The amount of additional number of correct suggestions beyond what Eclipse does. Um, and the y this y-axis is an actual number of correct suggestions, additional correct suggestions. So this is proportion, and this is the actual number of additional correct suggestions. So the punchline is it's always doing better than Eclipse by merging the two. So going back to the discussion I was having with uh, Max yesterday, there's no cost to using this. You just have to estimate the language model and throw it in there. Performance-wise, it doesn't really take any time at all. So uh, to use this over using the native Eclipse, there's no performance penalty. Yes? So you do have problems with false positives, like providing suggestions that don't make sense? Uh, so Eclipse also provides uh, false positives. So this is just considering how often in the top two suggestions you have a correct answer. So, so that's a good point. So, you know, what this tells you is almost always you get a slight higher chance of having the correct suggestion to talk to. So there are different ways to measure this. Uh, one way is mean reciprocal rank, which is basically you take the geometric mean of the highest rank of the correct answer. Right. So the closer you get to one, the closer you're getting the correct answer. So yeah. So merging the two always helps. So there are a few, um, there's an Eclipse Java suggestion engine that's available. It's called Kashka, if you can download it. We're just submitting a pull request for a Python suggestion engine for uh, the Eclipse Python plugin. And that's actually good because Python, there's no dynamic type, so there's no static type information. So the suggestion from Python and Eclipse is very poor. So Ingress really helps a lot in that case. So there's, we have a pull request that's been submitted to 
get that uh, acceptance of the Eclipse pipeline to work. Okay, so there's always the benefit to using Eclipse, and um, once you use it, um, it will give you a benefit. Okay, so um, the so we're going to present a couple of things that have happened, uh, you know, uh, in this area that are additional applications of this work. So the first thing that we did that was uh, related to this was that noticing that chord is different from English. Right? One thing that's peculiar to chord is that it's, uh, unlike English, is a modularity of chord. Right? So every module in chord is special. It produces something new and different. Right? And in English, it's not the case. Right? Uh, you know, any section of English is more or less stationary. It doesn't change that much. Right? So to illustrate this, um, so you consider this plot. So this is called a type token plot. So essentially on the x-axis is, think of it as a pass through a corpus. So you have a corpus of English text or code text, and it's sort of scanning through it. Right? When you're at 0%, you haven't seen any of it yet. When you're at 100%, you've seen all of it. Okay, you're scanning through it from there, from the beginning to the end. Right? With no particular thing, it's just basically going through the text in the order that you can see it. So if you're looking at a Java corpus, you start at the first Java program and you go through the whole corpus. So that's the x-axis. And the y-axis is the number of different vocabulary items that you've seen. Okay. So, you know, in a typical English corpus, you have roughly 50,000 different vocabulary items, right? So, um, so what you have here, the top curve, is the brown curve. So what we're measuring is, after we've seen 20% of the brown corpus, what proportion of the different vocabulary items have you seen so far? So after you've seen 20%, you've seen about half the different vocabulary items. Okay? Right? And as you've seen about 40%, you've seen about 70% of the vocabulary items. Right? And after you've seen 60%, you've seen about 80 and then so you have sort of saturation of that. Right? So if all the words in English were the same word, after you've seen the first word, you've seen all of it. So the curve will go up 100% after the first word in century. Okay? If every word in English were different, right, then what would the curve look like? A good perfect diagonal line, right? Because every time you saw a new, a new word, it'd be a word you've never seen before. So it would be, you know, as you see 40% of the word, you're just a 40% of the corpus, you'd see 40% of the word. Right? So you're always going to see some saturation, right? Because words are repeated in between English and Java. Right? So the interesting thing here, what you see is that English saturates faster than so consider this brown, we'll get to this this blue line in a minute. Look at this line. This is Java. Java saturates less. Why is that? Than English? What does that mean? That means basically Java is closer to the diagonal than English. Right? So the perfect, uh, the, you know, all the words are the same word, you have perfect saturation. Right? Now English is not perfect saturation, but it is saturated in the sense that not that many new words are being used. Uh, used right? Now in Java, you get closer to the diagonal. That means Java is introducing new words, more so than English. Why? For the identifiers. Identifiers, right? Because every module tends to introduce some new identifiers, right? So Java is actually saturating less than English. Right? Now look what happens when we split the identifiers. So we use the stupid identifier splitter. There are very fancy identifier splitters. We just split identifiers using camel case and underscores. Okay? When we split identifiers to get closer to diagonal, what does that mean? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Maybe it's wrong. This is Java without the identifier split, right? I'm sorry, I read that. I apologize. I read that. Okay. Without the identifier split, Java is close to diagonal. Because every module is introducing new words, right? New identifiers. When we split the identifiers, it moves closer to English. Because identifiers are made up of the same, when you split them, they're made up of the same words over and over again. So when you split the identifiers, it moves closer to English. So I apologize for messing that up, right? So when you don't split the identifiers, you keep getting new words. When you split the identifiers, you, you see more saturation. Yeah? So that's what you would expect, right? So it's. Um, it's so, German instead of uh, and English, German will be more near the other because they use opposite words, right? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, so, um, 
It's like not have you split something and like uh, the Java not split. That's right. Although, you know, I don't, so I don't think Germans are as likely to invent new words as programmers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. That would not be good because that would make for inefficient, that would, be, that would not be very good, you know. Maybe it would be okay. I mean, if, if are there any, I know there's one German speaker here. There are more? Okay. <laughs> there is a slight evidence. There is a paper from German. Researchers on consistent and concise identifier naming. They oh. came up with a tool that controlled vocabulary with the consistent vocabulary. So it's just a side piece of. Oh, okay. But, <laughs> but no, I mean, so, so I guess the question is whether if you make up a, a new aggl agglutination, yeah. I don't know what the German word for that is, but English is called agglutination. There must be one word for that. <laughs> 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 I <been> the <laughs> so, um, so the question is, if you make up a new word like that, would your listeners understand, you? would they struggle? If, you are, if your listeners are going to struggle, then it's not a good idea. You wouldn't do that too often. Right? I don't know. I mean, if you see a new agglutination, do you know immediately what it means? You can guess. So, okay, so in that case, people probably make them up on the fly. I mean, have you made up any of your own? Have you invented any of your you yourself have you invented new agglutinations? Uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's just natural. I mean, it's part of the language. So it's, it's okay to invent new ones? Yeah, it's okay to do them together. Ah, okay, it's okay. When I listen to someone speak Italian, it sounds like one huge long word to me. It breaks me. So my native language is Tamil. And you can certainly do that in Tamil all day long. It's, you know, you can take, you can make a, you know, you can say something like the person who was, a person who was crying yesterday was eating pudding. That could be one word. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally okay. <laughs> so, so, in theory, so you can have a language that makes this, uh, that allows this uh, a good common word that should be. I think you're right. If you split, then it goes out. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that should be. Yeah, I think, you know, in most cases, when you see a variable name, you kind of know what it means. You know, if you don't know what the variable name means, then it's a bad variable name. You know, so I think, I guess what he's saying is that the same thing applies in German, and I guess same thing in my language. Uh, so, you know, it's just that, you know, yeah, I, I guess, you know, the famous example with the downship, you know, Versicherungsgemeinschaft or whatever. Um, maybe to a native German speaker, they see that and they know what it means. But you know, for non-native speakers, it's like, wow, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> okay, so um, so you know, so this is special about Java, right? So this is Java. In Java, you have this sort of new vocabulary is being invented and being used. So the traditional language models, if you use off-the-shelf natural language model for for Java, it's not going to work so well, right? So we should be surprised that it worked as well as it did. But yeah, you shouldn't expect it to work. This really is quite different. Right? Questions about this? So it's just meant to show that the vocabulary usage is different. Okay, so you know, so there's there's more data. I mean, sorry, this talk is, <laughs> but um, some more inter interesting information about this. So what this is showing is this is essentially the proportion of unigrams, by trigrams, six grams, and ten grams that occur only in one file. Okay, so we're comparing Java, Python, and English. What is the proportion of unigrams, trigrams, and so on and so forth that occur only in one file? Okay, so we can take for example Java. In Java, 25.63% of all trigrams occur only in one file. You never see them anywhere else. Okay. In English, even more dramatic, right? So if you take the brown corpus and you split it up in a reasonable way according to some sort of size boundary, I don't remember the exact numbers you used, but you try to model it in the same way. 72% of trigrams occur only in one file. You never see them again after that. Okay. So in fact, you know, both of these are, you know, kind of have this what we call endemicity. I don't know, uh, you know, this is the word that's used in English. 
endemic, endemic I don't know if you've heard this word, but it's often used with respect to environmental science. So you might say, for example, a certain kind of fox or rabbit is endemic to the California Central Valley. You don't see it anywhere else. Right? So that's, that's why we use this word endemicity. It refers only one place. Specificity is how often you see it there. Right? So how often do you see it in that place? So look at the different between Java and English. In Java, 25% of, of trigrams occur only in one file, but they occur more than twice, 11% of the time in one file. So they occur in only one file, but they repeat it more than twice in that file, 11% of the time. Okay? When you look at six grams, 53.54% of the time they occur only in one file, but 16% of the time they repeat it in that file more than twice. Okay? Now when you get to English, the difference is dramatic. Okay? 99% of 6 grams are from 1 to 1 file, but they're not repeated. Okay. This is a really important difference, and it's kind of weird. Right? But if you think about it, it makes sense. Right? In English, if you come up with a 6 trigram, if you repeat it within the same small file, it looks weird. Right? Why would you do that? You write a sentence and write the same sentence again, and you know, the same file, uh, this looks weird. Right? You may do it in log. Actually, this is a good question. You should try this in log. We don't know how this works out in log. We haven't done that. Um, but in, in, in code, it's not that surprising. Why? Well, because of local variables, because of API calls, things like this. In one region of the code, you're focusing on some API. You're defining some local variables and using them. So it's not that surprising that it repeats. Okay? So it's a bit of a subtle point. Please ask if this is not clear. This is an important difference between code and English. So what does this mean? This means that if you're building statistical models, you better not ignore this. Right? So this local repetitiveness is really an important property of code. And you have to take this into account when you're developing models of code. Okay. So essentially what we're saying is, you know, there are some things that are occurring only in one file, but they're repeated in that file often for code. For Java and Python, they occur only in one place, they're also repeated. In English, yes, you have the same phenomenon. They occur in only one file, but they're not repeated. Okay. So what this means is that if you're building a language model, the language model should have some local memory. It should say, okay, you know, I'm in this file, and you know, I think this special thing is going to happen in this file more than once. I'm going to remember something about the local context, and I'm going to make advantage of that. And this local thing, I'm going to increase the probability of that than what I would get from the global context. If I increase this probability of the local thing, I'm going to get a lower entropy score. Okay, so you know, so specific patterns get repeated, right? So for example, in some files you might use file i equals zero to thing, in some other files you might go, go for i equals start to end. Right? So one to ten here, start to end here, this gets repeated in this file, this gets repeated in this file. You should know that this is going to be repeated in this file and take advantage of it. Okay, so how do we do that? All right. So um, so essentially, we have this thing called a cache model. So the, there's a cache, which is like a full n-gram model, except it's local. It just remembers the local things. Right? And it's OK, because it's only a small context. So we can remember <coughs> trigrams, 4 grams, 6 grams, 10 grams, 12 grams. We can remember all this stuff. It's not such a big deal, because we're only going to remember it for a little while. That's only a small amount of code. Right? So if you're only maintaining a cache in the last megabyte of data, a cache doesn't really have to be bigger than a megabyte. You just have to remember counts, right, for a megabyte of stuff. And we can use this to improve the performance. So, so it essentially, it remembers only patterns that are specific to a certain locality and that occur only in a specific locality. So when you specific and endemic, things are going to be remembered, right? So for how long should we remember this, right? So what we look at in this plot is, given the order of n grams, we look at the distance between the repetitions, right? So as we go longer, we get longer distance between the repetitions. The y axis is log scale. So we can see that you know things are repeated within a quarter of thousand tokens, right? So most of these repetitions occur within the scope of a thousand tokens. So you don't have to remember for a long period of time. And if you keep throwing out the cache as you scan through the data and you build the model, after about a thousand tokens, you can flush the cache. Right? So that's what this is basically showing. So what we do here essentially is a mixture model. Right? So there's two terms here. This is the n-gram model, and this is the cache model. Right? 
both of these models are trying to predict the next token given a context. So the conditional distribution, what is the next token given a context? Right? And we have two independent aspects of the model. One model is predicting the next token using the n model. The other model is using the next token, predicting the next token using a cache. Right? And this gives us a probability. This gives us a probability, right? Which means they add up to one, right? And the result has to add up to one. So the way we make it add up to one is by doing a, a you know, convex mixture, right? Lambda times this plus one minus lambda times that. Okay, so that gives us a mixture of the two probabilities. Now, of course, we have to estimate the lambdas. How do we estimate what the lambda is? I'll show you how that's done. Okay, so the lambda is basically based on how often we see the, the, the context in the, in the cache. So it's, it's set to one, 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 one divided by one plus h, where h is the count of the token in the cache. And uh, the other value is set by one minus that value of lambda that we basically as the So that's how we set this. So this is, uh, a, this is in um, FSC 2014. Um, the lead author is a postdoc at uh, Jaume II. Okay, so how does this work? All right, so we're gonna essentially do English and code, and English with the cache, code with the cache. So this is without the cache, this is with the cache. So we want to essentially gauge how much the improvement is by using the cache. Okay. So that's, you know, we've seen these plots uh, before, the English plot, right? Um, so that's English, this is English without the cache, and this is English with the cache. So the pure English plot we've seen before, what you can see is it doesn't really help much, right? It helps a little bit from the unigram because some vocabulary words are used in the local context and they get repeated in the context. So the unigram model is something but after that, it doesn't really help much. Okay. Um, now there's code. That's the code without the cache. Now when we add the cache, okay. Now you might look at that and say, eh, really? <laughs> They're making a big fuss and FSC paper for this. <laughs> well, actually, remember, this is almost one whole bit, right? So what does that mean? That means it's twice as a factor of two improvement of prediction, right? Okay, so this is an important thing, right? When you evaluate a language model, there are two kinds of evaluation. Entropy is what we call an intrinsic evaluation. It's evaluating the model by itself, right? That's not enough in many cases. There's also something called an extrinsic evaluation, where you use the model for an engineering task, and you see how the model performs an engineering task. So we're gonna see that as well, right? So at the moment, I just wanna point out that one bit is doubling the performance of the model, right? So it's essentially really, remember it's log scale, so it's actually, it's ascending double the probability, you know, for things that are pretty good. So it's really not, not a trivial improvement. It's a full bit improvement in performance. You know, in, in statistical language processing, you get a 0.25 or 0.1 bit improvement in performance, you get a test paper award. <laughs> <laughs> because there, what they, what they will tell you is that if you improve the language model, you improve speech recognition, you improve translation, you know, that really matters. Okay, so uh, mixture model performance. So, um, so essentially what we see here is that uh, top five accuracy for the raw engram model for Java, that is predicting the next token, right? Basically, the, that's a task. The extrinsic task here is predicting the next token. Uh, with engram, you get 65%. With the cache plus engram, you get an initial 12% improvement in performance, right? And with Python, top five accuracy, 55% with engram, and with cache plus engram, so this provides a substantial uh, improvement in performance. But right, questions so far about cash model. So the, you know this kind of work, you know, uh, there's, there's, you know, uh, there's a lot of this that needs to be done, where we essentially take the technology that's been developed in NLP and try to adapt this to code. Because code is different in some ways, um, and you know we can probably in many cases just use the technology. From directly from NLP and get some interesting results, but I think there's a lot of good engineering to be done trying to improve those models, adapt those models, or code. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about a couple more applications, um, and then we'll get into some. Um, I think I think what I'll do is I have some stuff you can play with that you can download and play with. I'll give you a pointer to that, and then if we have time, I'll get into a little bit about uh, language models, uh, technology of language models. Okay, so. Um, Forty-five minutes. Yeah, yeah, thirty-five minutes. Thirty-five minutes. Forty-five. Forty-five minutes. Sorry. Okay. Sorry.
he's suggesting me the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, um, so one of the things, quest interesting questions that we got uh, want to look at is there's something unnatural about buggy cord. Does buggy cord seem weird or odd and surprising in some ways? Is that a good way to find it? Okay. So you know. So when we decided to study this, we we you know we said look you know we have a lot of history of bug fixes in open source projects. You know, there's thousands and thousands of bugs that have been fixed. Around. So we know the buggy lines. We know which lines are actually buggy and have been fixed. So we can simply go through the buggy lines in a large data set from GitHub. And we can build language models on those projects for those versions of the code where these bugs were introduced. And we can measure the entropy of the, of the buggy lines. So what we're doing is we're going back in history and we're saying, at the time when these lines were added, did they look surprising and weird? And is that a good way to find bugs? Is the question clear? So I should consider doing a historical study going back over the history of bug fixes and saying, are these bugs actually somehow surprising? Do they look weird? Can they be identified by language models? Okay. So, uh, so first methodology, part of this is to identify bug lines. Right. So you take any project that makes these series of commits. Okay, so zero from one commits as the project history goes on. Let's assume that this particular commit is a bug fix. Okay. Right, so what does that mean? That means that there was a bug before the commit, <laughs> the bug was fixed after the commit. Okay. So that means some lines were changed in this bug fix commit. Okay. Have you guys seen SCZ before? How many of you have seen SCZ? Oh, good, okay. So this is basically SCZ, right? Slippers, um, keys, others, and whatever. Okay, so there's these lines that were changed. These are the buggy lines. Okay, now if we can identify these, you know, before, as soon as they were in the code, right, we can fix them, right, before the user actually discovers them. Right? So these lines of code, well, they were introduced somewhere, right? Somewhere, somewhere they came in. How do we know where they came in? Well, we can do blame, right? So git blame tells us where the line of the code went in. Okay, so using git blame, we can see actually these lines were actually added a long time ago in this commit over here. Okay. So, so then basically, we would like to find that, use, use some kind of language modeling to find these lines as soon as they were added, right? And then tell the programmer, look, you know, you put these lines in, they don't look right to me, you should probably fix them. Okay. So it's kind of like compatible to something like find bugs, except it's very different. The way find bugs works is that it actually analyzes score and tries to predict where you know, to say this line of code is using some improper coding standard or violating some sort of coding principle from you know based on the theory that the people who build the find bugs tool have right they have some theory about what code is incorrect and it tries to find those things this is very different this basically says I have a model of what code is supposed to look at like look like at this time and your code doesn't look like it I don't know why <laughs> but this looks weird okay so that's the idea here right so now, what that means essentially is, at the time these lines of code are added, you have to have a language model of the code base. You have to have a statistical model of the code base. You have to estimate this model, and every time new lines are added, you have to run those new lines through this model and see what the entropy score is. Okay? So if you want to run this experiment backwards in time, you basically have to estimate a language model at every command. Right? We're not going to do that, right? There's too many commits. Estimating language model at every commit is very expensive. We're not going to do that. So what we do instead is we make these snapshots. Right? We make six-month snapshots. And every six months, we estimate the language model. Okay, so, so snapshot zero, somewhere here, we estimate the language model. Right? And every commit that happens after snapshot zero, you run it through the language model. You get an entropy score. Okay? And our theory is, okay, if somebody adds buggy lines, then the model that's estimated on snapshot zero should say, this looks funny. This doesn't look like real code. Okay? So just to recap, every six months, we estimate a language model. Right? Every commit that's made between snapshots, we run them through the language model, right? And we see which lines are marked with what entropy score. <coughs> if a line is marked with high entropy score, then we suspect it's bug. 
Okay, now since we have a history of bug fixes in a project, we can see how good this is. Yes? Uh, does it mean that if a project introduces new terms, it's marked that? Yeah. Good point. Yes, we would, because we've never seen it before. So we're marked. So it's a false positive. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's false positive. Absolutely. I mean, there are tricks you can play. I mean, you could say, you know, this commit introduced a new variable name, we're not going to consider the buggy. But if it introduces a name we've already seen before in a way that we didn't expect, then we're going to mark it buggy. Right? So if it's a vocabulary that already exists, then we're going to mark this buggy. Would you do that? Okay, so um, so that's the question. Can we do this? All right, so here's, here's, the, here's the question. Right? The question is, are the natural lines buggy lines? Okay. So here we have three box plots. The y-axis is the entropy score. These are the non-buggy lines. Right? These are lines that are not buggy. This is their entropy distribution. This is the buggy lines. This is the entropy distribution of buggy lines. And this is the distribution of lines after the fix. Okay? So this is as we might expect. Right? So essentially, you know, uh, uh, buggy lines have, I don't know, on the average, um, maybe three, four bits higher. Right? They're about eight times more unlikely or eight times more surprising. You know, three bits is true than probably eight, right? So, what eight times more surprising than buggy lines? And the interesting thing is, when you fix it, the entropy goes down. So, the, the stroke port starts to look more like normal port. Okay. So, this is what you know. What what the theory predicts that buggy lines, in fact, are high entropy. Right? Questions? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, some examples of this. You know, so um, here is a bug fix. So. This line uh, was the original line before the bug fix. Uh, had this method set success being called, and the entropy score was about six bits. Okay. And then after the bug fix, it changed to try success, and the entropy score dropped to 1.24 bits. Okay. Obviously, this is a, a chosen example of the other state of mind. Uh, it's not always this dramatic. Okay. Um, and so here's another one. Uh, it was a, a, a method call where there's no conditional check. Um, and in general, supposedly, this condition should be checked. So when they check the condition, the entropy drops by 2.87 bits. Okay. So this suggests, you know, in some sense, that um, if you had a way of sampling from the model, right? So if you had a model that generates for code, um, there, there are generative models and descriptive models. Descriptive models will take something into the probability, and generative models generate samples from the distribution. Okay, so if you had a generative model that generates samples from a distribution, you can use that model to automatic code better. To my knowledge, nobody's done this before, but it's an interesting idea. Right? So, do um, you, you see the difference between generative model and a, a, a descriptive model? Right? So, um, for example, in R, you can use R to generate samples from a normal distribution, or from a binomial distribution, or any kind of Poisson distribution, so it's generative distribution, right? Uh, or you can say, given a variable with a distribution of this parameter, what are the probabilities? Those are two different things. So, so far, all the language model stuff I've shown you are, 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 are um, descriptive models. Um, the question is, can you do generative models and what would that look like? So, nobody's done that yet, but it's, it's an interesting idea. So, maybe you can fix bugs by running a language model in a generative mode, if you can figure out how to do that. Okay, so, um, Buggy lines have higher entropies than non-buggy lines, and entropy drops after buggy fixes. Right? Okay, so, um, so one thing interesting is, you know, so uh, this is not related to, not related to um, entropy necessarily, uh, but essentially this is a, dis uh, a cumulative distribution of bugs, in the, since we analyzed a lot of bugs in detail. Um, so, you know, so what you see here is that basically, uh, you know, most bugs are not more than 60 lines of code, right? So it's very few, once you get beyond that, there's not many bugs that are bigger than that. So most bugs are pretty small. Um, and here's another interesting plot is um, the effect strength, right? So when you compare buggy lines and non-buggy lines, you get an effect size, coin speed, right? When you get an effect size. And, you know, so we have various sizes of bugs, right? So these are small bugs, these are big bugs. And this is the effect size, the difference between the bugs, buggy lines, and the non-buggy lines for the for different uh, different lines. 
So, what would you expect this to look like? Would the effect size be bigger for small bikes or for big bikes? Difference in internet. Yes. Are you saying that uh, if we set a uh, threshold for uh, uh, for entropy, we can uh, localize the bias? Possibly. I don't know. It's, it's a good question. We can do the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> the software will be available. I the making the software. I'm not sure how to download it. So you can try it. I think it's a good idea. It may be. Um, because what you see here is that the small bugs have highest effect size. Right? So as you go larger, the, the effect sizes are smaller. So the small bugs show the biggest effect size. 